Um, if, if everyone can take their seats, we're going to start in about two minutes. Starting in two minutes, thank you. Okay, so if everyone can get their last snacks and move to their seats, we'll, we'll get started. We, we like to start on time and, and uh, be disciplined about that. We find it, it works out best for everyone. Um, so my name's Andrew Etherington. I'm a, a senior account manager with, with e &M, an industrial automation company. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, with Sean Edwards from Ross Industrial here, who's going to really give you the meaty part of this workshop, uh, the reason that you're all here. Um, but I'm just going to uh, go through a couple of things, uh, administrative things, and just talk a little bit uh, in, the, in the way of introduction. So a few weeks ago, <laughs> my wife asked me um, why I had so many pairs of socks with robots on them. And, and I said, well, you know, there, I, I, I'm working with, I'm helping robot customers, so I have socks with robots on them, it seems logical. Um, she said, but three or four years ago, you only had one or two pairs. Now you've got loads. What's up with that? What's going on? And I said, well, that's interesting, because it is true that three or four years ago, uh, I was only working with one or two robot companies, and now I'm working with lots of robot companies. And, and, and I said to my wife, I said, well, you know, I think I've got the greatest job in the world. I love looking for robots, whether they're stationary or mobile robots. This is what I do. I look for robots. I've, I've got some great uh, industrial sensor products uh, from SICK that I sell that are, work, are succeeding very well. And industrial robots, and, and it's a lot of fun. Um, but my wife says, well, when you tell it like that, it sounds like you're responsible for this whole explosion of robots around the Bay Area. And as much as I would have liked to have said, yes, it was me that did it, um, <coughs> it, it wasn't really. It was a number of, it was a number of factors. Um, there was a great article in uh, IEEE Spectrum recently, which was a reprint of an econom economic article uh, theorizing that right now a Cambrian explosion, like the Cambrian explosion in evolution was happening when, when there was a sudden burst of diversification of lots of different species. Um, the article uh, hypothesizes that the same thing is happening in robotics because that's what the evidence is showing is that there, there are a, a number of technical factors and things that have come together uh, at this time that are resulting in an explosion in, in the, uh, the number of robots um, that, that are around. And th there are other, um, you know, some of them are anecdotal and some of them are hard facts, some of them are hard market data. One of the ones I like um, uh, explaining how robotics is growing is Frank Tobe. Uh, he publishes the Robot Report online. He observed that uh, three years ago, there were uh, a total of 13 industry analyst reports um, reporting on the robotics market. Uh, that was three years ago, just 13. And this year, uh, it's only September, and there have already been 53 uh, of, of these types of analyst reports uh, published, which means that there's a lot of interest and something's going on, and it certainly correlates um, with my experience. Um, but what we're here to talk about today is, is, in my opinion, one of the things that's really stoking the robot revolution and stimulating robots everywhere, and that's the robot operating system. 
Um, and so we're, we're, uh, we, we have put this workshop together. Uh, it's sponsored by SICK Industrial Sensors. Uh, and ENM, we are the California uh, distributors for SICK. And uh, we uh, are doing our part to help stimulate the uh, robotics industry around here and, and promote uh, ROS because we think it's, it's really is helping uh, the robot revolution. So just a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Page up, page down. Oh. Okay. I'm clicking. Oh, oh we're not, we don't have PowerPoint selected or something. Next slide. Okay, so we'd, we'd like to uh, keep things disciplined. Um, I'm just going to spend the first few minutes here in introducing uh, Sean and, and, and the workshop. And, and then uh, we have uh, a break uh, at 10.30 to 11. And then Sean will... Uh, tell you when you need to be back, and we'd like everybody to be back um, and, and ready to go so that we don't hold everybody up, because we know all of you have other things to do after this. Um, and, and the actual workshop uh, presentation part is over by noon, and there is a complimentary lunch uh, for those that want to hang around and uh, ask questions and look some more at some of the, uh, the interesting sensors that we have at the back. Um, the restrooms, for those of you that haven't found them, are back across the lobby. Um, just go to the far side of the lobby and you'll see there's a restroom sign there. Um, and there is a USB key, uh, which everyone will get a copy of. It has a bunch of interesting stuff on it. And the way you get the USB key is to complete the, uh, the short survey about the workshop um, that you've all been handed. Uh, I, I understand that uh, some are, if, if not some, but all of them were actually handed out. They have people's names on them, and I think they got mixed up. Uh, if you just want to, when you fill it out, just cross the name out uh, that's on there and put your own name. That would be awesome. Thank you. So the USB file has a copy of uh, the presentation, um, and it has some virtual machines, which Sean's going to talk about, some exercises. It has some sick product information uh, regarding laser scanners and sensors for robots and sick uh, software. One of the things uh, that's on there that, uh, not all, uh, that, that, that is not distributed widely online is, is a Linux-based uh, version of the sick setup software. So that's quite useful um, because ROS runs on, uh, on Ubuntu, on, on uh, versions of Linux. And I know a lot of you that are actually working on robots are using Linux and prefer to use that. So we've put that on there as well. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff on that USB key. So that's me, or a 1950s tin robot. Um, and I, I work at ENM. I'm based in San Francisco. Uh, and in, in uh, the public domain, I'm known as ENM's top robot guy. Sean will actually talk some more about himself when he gets into his presentation. So I'm not going to preempt uh, any of that. But so as my collection of socks was growing, this is kind of what was happening in, in, uh, in, in the world. Um, Willow Garage, uh, uh, who created Ross, was founded in 2007, and uh, they they developed uh, Ross um, and put it out in the public domain version 1.0 in in 2010, and it, it it's gone through several revisions. Um, Ross Industrial was spawned off. Sean's going to explain the difference between Ross and Ross Industrial, um, and in parallel to that. SICK uh, and, and myself were working with uh, six optical laser scanning uh, products. We're probably best known for the Google Street View cars. Every one of those cars has got three of the large long range uh, SICK scanners on it and we became well known for that. Um, but those laser scanners were also used in robotic applications such as the uh, Stanford 
um, Stanley self-driving car that won the DARPA challenge. And since 2007, the, the product has evolved. We, sh we radically shrank it. There are some at the back of the room, the tiny TIMs, they're called small laser scanners. And these small laser scanners are used in robots like the Fetch Robotics uh, Ross robot. So SICK has a, a long heritage of making uh, sensors for robotics. Um, we just launched a, uh, a new 3D time of flight uh, camera uh, for robotics. There's one of those at the back. Um, you're actually the first large room full of people to actually see that uh, this 3D, industrial 3D camera in, in the country, it was just released. So take a look at that. If you're interested in 3D uh, uh, point clouds, that, then it's, it's pretty cool. So at the back of the room also with us, uh, our Andrew Kay is here from Silicon Valley Robotics. Um, I can't say enough good things about uh, Silicon Valley Robotics it's, um, and, and what Andrea is doing for robotics uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, she's uh, the, the perfect person um, to bring together the whole of the robotics community in, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. She's a great social catalyst. Um, she uh, holds a lot of events, knows a lot of people, uh, and is a really... Uh, um, great person to know. Um, she's at the back of the room. She'll tell you more about Silicon Valley Robotics, but she's helped us um, with, this, uh, with this workshop, and we want to thank her for doing that. Fetch Robotics have an actual uh, working Ross robot back there, and uh, it, it is the robot that um, they're out in the market with right now for uh, picking and placing and, and uh, the delivery and, and movement of goods in, in s small and medium warehouses. And we want to thank them for being here with us, uh, showing what Ross robots can actually do. And as I said, there is a table back there with some uh, of the most popular um, SICK sensors that are used in robotics. For those of you that don't know SICK, um, Six is one of those names that if, you, if you're not in industrial automation, it kind of sounds cool. Actually, our logo was really popular. We give it away all the time, stickers and baseball hats and everything. Um, but uh, Six, a German company, it's actually the last name of Dr. Owen Zick, who founded it in 1947. And our revenues are over a billion dollars. Um, and we make all kinds of industrial sensors. And, and what uh, we're doing here today is, is, is giving back to the Ross community. The Ross community is helping uh, stimulate the uh, design and building of robots, and this is great for our industry. Um, so um, we want to thank uh, the whole OSRF and, and the Ross organization for, for doing what they've done, and, and Sean with Ross Industry. So with that, um, <laughs> thanks, Cam. With that, I'm going to hand over to Sean, uh, and uh, he's going to uh, tell us about uh, the basics of getting started with Ross. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. All right, thank you. Cool. Yeah, give Andrew a round of applause. I told Andrew I'm jealous of his title. I, I, I didn't know I could, I could choose top robot, a robotics guy. Um, so, um, my name is Sean Edwards. Thank you guys all for coming out. Uh, I realize this is, this is in the middle of the week, which probably means you guys have other things you should be doing, but I'm glad you're, uh, coming here to learn a little bit about robotics. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I really love robotics. Uh, I'm with Andrew, the, the explosion we've seen, um, uh, is, is pretty amazing, and in Silicon Valley, it feels like this is the epicenter of it, so this is all very exciting. Okay, I'm gonna give a, an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, first, I'll do some introductions. I'll tell you about myself. Um, I'm pretty boring, though, so I'll, I'll keep that limited. Um, and then I'll kind of uh, survey the audience 
an audience this big will we'll try and do things by hand. Um, but you know, I've given this presentation or similar presentations a lot, um, and I like to tailor it for the audience. So those questions I'm going to kind of ask um, are, you know, just to get to know you guys and, and really make sure this presentation speaks directly to you to this audience. We'll talk about Ross and Ross Industrial uh, capabilities. I'll give you a high-level overview, um, and we'll we'll touch on some technical details, but not too many. And uh, then we'll move on to applications. Everybody, everybody wants to know what can Ross do, and there's the technical side of that, and then there's what cool things does it actually accomplish. Um, I work in the industrial space, so I always want to know how can I make Ross make other things. Um, but you know, there's cool robots out there, and for some of you, I'm sure you just want to know how can I make Ross just work on my robot. So I'm going to try and give you an idea of the things that you can do uh, using Ross. Um, and then at the, uh, the end or the, the final session, we'll talk about um, the basics of Ross. So we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into the technical details. Um, you know, the, when the guys from e &M came to me, they're like, well, we just, we just want a tutorial on Ross. That'll, that'll take like two hours, right? Um, takes a little bit longer than that, but I'm going to do my best to at least give you a sense of things, um, and most importantly, figure out how you guys can, can or tell you guys how you can get help yourself. Um, and so that'll be very important. Uh, before I get too much into this, uh, you know, uh, Andrew kind of brought this up. Ross is much larger than any one person or any one company, but we do have to give credit to uh, Willow Garage initially, who had uh, developed Ross and started uh, this this whole thing, um, and then uh, the Open Source Robotics Foundation. So Willow Garage shut down a few years ago, and the Open Source Robotics Foundation um, had had already been spun up, and they kind of took the lead in, in developing Ross. Um, and this is this is a good open source story because if Willow Garage were a company that were selling software, and they closed down, that would be the end of it. We We'd, we'd, nobody would be here talking about Ross. Uh, but because it's open source and because there's a community around it and because there are organizations like OSRF, it lived on well beyond Willow Garage. Um, that's, that's a pretty important takeaway, I think. All right, I'm going to get to know you first. Uh, so, show of hands, um, what's, what's your background in robotics? How many of you consider yourself just a hobbyist? You just want to play with robots. Good number, good number. I'm a hobbyist, but I get paid to do it too, so I'm not sure what group I fall into. Um, what about academics? Uh, okay. And then how many, how many are from industry? How many are lucky enough to get paid to do this stuff? That's a good number. Uh, just last week, I was watching a robot that we had been programming for four months. And I was just watching it go. It was actually working by itself at that point. <laughs> and uh, I was just amazed that we can get paid to do this kind of stuff. Um, and it's only getting better. Um, so of the audience, what's the primary interest in robotics? How many of you are interested in mobile platforms? Well, that's a good number. Um, how about manipulators and ARM? Making your, OK. Um, uh, drones, good number. Is there like a really cool robot type that I don't even know about? No, those three kind of cover it. I'm, I'm always hoping there's going to be something really cool. Somebody's going to be like, I got the new next robot. And they're going to share it with me. Um, so uh, I want to kind of understand what people want to take away from this. Um, this class, how many of you are hoping you go from, that, that you can just program your robot with Ross after this class? Hoping? Sure. How many of you aren't interested in programming, but you're, you're, you're here so that you can tell engineers below you to learn how to program their robots? Nobody's going to admit to that? Come on, there we go. All right. Um, 
That's good. So uh, I, you know, I'll try and keep it high level, but there's enough detail for the guys who, guys and girls who really want to program robots. Hopefully, we'll we'll give you enough information so you can do that. Uh, background on myself. Uh, my so I'm a senior research engineer at Southwest Research Institute. Um, everything we're showing you shows says Ross Industrial because you know that's that's kind of our product. But Southwest Research Institute. Um, and myself, we initiated Ross Industrial, um, and the, uh, I'd say a lot of the developers are at Southwest Research Institute, uh, but at, at this point, more than half are actually external to Southwest Research. But we're still a big player in the Ross Industrial world. Um, I have 10 years of experience just in manufacturing R&D in general. I've done everything from program a PLC for a machine that makes boxes, um, that was like my first task. Um, and uh, within the last couple of years, I programmed the largest robots in the world that strip paint off of fighter aircraft. Um, so there's a, a big, <laughs> um, a lot of different applications that I've been involved with. Um, about three years ago, we started Ross Industrial because we kind of saw this wave coming. I don't think we predicted it would be as big as it is at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, we saw the wave of Ross and we saw applications in manufacturing, the stuff that Andrew was talking about that uh, SICK does, um, you know, those kinds of sensors and those, those applications. Um, and we felt like we could pull Ross in that direction. And I think we've done a really good job of doing that. Okay. So a little, few more audience questions. Who, how, how many of you are somewhat familiar with Ross? Okay. How many have no clue what Ross is? Okay. How many are experts? Well, good. Christina works with me. You should be raising your hand. She is an expert. By the way, she can answer questions too. And so if I don't make it clear, she can clarify. <laughs> um, who has uh, programmed with Ross in the past? Right. Who has not? Oh, there's a lot of knots. Okay. We might spend a little bit more time on the basics then. Um, but that's good. Um, and how many of you understand the difference between Ross and Ross Industrial? Yep. I'm horrible at communicating. Thank you. Uh, I'll try and clarify that. And uh, the fact that you don't understand the difference isn't so important. It's okay. I'll explain. All right. Um, Here's an introduction to Ross. Uh, these slides were shamelessly stolen probably five years ago from Willow Garage. Um, but we, we give them over and over again because they really do uh, nail, nail down exactly what Ross is um, and um, do it in a very concise manner, even though I'm up here kind of talking and bothering about it. But first off, why did they create Ross? What, what was the need? You know, why, why did somebody feel it was worthwhile to invest so much money uh, into developing software and then give it away? That's, who, who does that? Um, so it started out at Willow Garage, and the majority of the people at Willow Garage were um, academics, or they had come out of academia. And they were researchers in robotics, and really, really good researchers, all very smart and intelligent. But what they found is that um, there's a lot of reinvention of the wheel. You go to university labs, they weren't working together, everybody started from scratch. I did when I did my master's thesis in robotics. I started from programming drivers on up. Um, and, you know, it was just reinventing the wheel. Uh, software engineers, it just goes against our, our grain to do that, right? But that's what's what, what was happening. There was little commonality. so. Uh, it's one thing for two university labs to not talk, uh, but within a university lab, there were students who were not talking, right? They weren't sharing code, they weren't doing, uh, they weren't developing things together. It was no commonality. Things have short lifespans, so if you are a grad student, your robot worked exactly long enough for you to get your PhD and no longer. Um, and once you left, they put that thing on a shelf, and they say, look, we built that once, and that was it. Um, 
So what you'd like to see is, you know, building, right? Grad students building on the works of, of previous grad students. And there was, there was some of that. The best labs certainly did that. But the majority of labs, they, they created paperweights and, and PhDs. And then uh, an inability to compare results. So from an academic perspective, you know, if you create perception algorithms, for example, you would like to compare your perception algorithm to somebody else's. And before Ross, what you would do is you would spend months, if not years, getting your perception algorithm just perfect. And then you'd go out to the literature and find one to compare it against, and you'd spend a day and a half and implement that one. And then you'd compare, and lo and behold, the one you spent a year working on, it's better. And that's how every robotics paper read. Um, but that wasn't true. That's what, they, that, that's what it read, but that wasn't true. So they needed something that would allow uh, researchers to, to really fairly compare um, methods and algorithms and, and robotics. So ROS solves all these problems. What is ROS? ROS is, I, so I explained why, why did we create ROS, but you know, what, what, did, what does ROS actually entail? And it's four things. Uh, it's plumbing. Um, so how do we get things to talk to each other? Um, tools. How do we make it easier for us to develop um, robotics uh, capabilities? So if I have a robot or I have an operating system, uh, I would expect that that operating system supports what I would want to do with a robot. Capabilities, just out of the box. I shouldn't have to develop capabilities from scratch. Um, and then ecosystem. You know, an ecosystem is this. We're all in a meeting together. We all work for different companies, but we've all come together around ROS. Um, and, uh, you know, ROS is a worldwide equal, equal ecosystem. There are developers and users all around the world, and we all collaborate in an open source way. So, all right, a little bit detail into what is plumbing. Um, so imagine you, um, you have a, a, a camera that you want to talk to, right? So in kind of the, the brute force approach is you load a camera driver in your program, you read images off of it, and you do whatever magic stuff you're going to do with a camera. Um, but that's only so helpful because then you're tied to a specific camera or you're tied to a specific library that talks to that camera. Um, it's not very flexible. So imagine a world where you kind of decouple those things and you say, I'm going to work on perception algorithm because that's what I'm good at. And somebody else is going to work on camera drivers. And then we're just going to agree to send data back and forth between our separate software processes. And we're going to agree on that format. That's, that's really what plumbing is. That's what Ross does, is it says you can create things separately, you know, separate processes, and there's a, an agreed upon message that we're gonna send back and forth. Um, the, the, the value in that, one of the values in that, is that it almost forces you to make your code modular when you, when you do that, right? That's a good thing, modularity is a good thing. Uh, the other thing is, if you're, uh, you're writing a camera driver in C++, that's the language I would like to use, but somebody wants to write perception algorithms in Python, not sure why, but maybe you would. Um, those two can't talk really, right? It's not like we can easily link those two together, but we can through ROS, because it, it again defines the messages that you're gonna send back and forth independent of the languages we're working in. So uh, one, one value of this is now you get companies like SICK saying, okay, I create laser scanners. There's a laser scanner message. I'm going to make sure that whatever drivers are written for devices like a laser scanner, SICK laser scanners, they produce this, this message. So it's, it's a, when you think about it, it means that you can take a SICK laser scanner and drop it in your, your robot program and it will work, but it also means you can take any other laser scanner and do that. Um, and some, some vendors, I deal with a lot of robot vendors in particular, they don't like that very much because then anybody, you can just swap in and out sensors, they become a commodity. Um, that's not entirely true. You know, when you're looking at laser scanners, there are things that certain vendors do very well and there are things that other vendors do 
differently, right? So you're really comparing on specs. But um, what I like to tell vendors is if it doesn't have a ROS driver, at this point, this community is going to move on. We're just not going to consider that. We're not even going to think about trying it. So it doesn't matter if your sensor is better or not. Um, so yeah, it makes your stuff a little bit of a commodity, but it also, if you don't have it, we're not going to consider it. And it's good. When this community gets large and it's getting larger, that we, we pull a lot of weight. Ross's tools, um, things like visualization, you know, it's much easier to debug a robot system where you can see all the data that you have. Um, things like logging. Nobody should ever have to write a logging program ever again. Um, it's just been done over and over and over again. So those kinds of tools, you know, viewing logs, dissecting logs, those tools have been developed in ROS. OK. Capabilities. Uh, so up until this point, everything I've described um, could be about any robotics framework, right? Every robotics framework kind of had a way for things to talk or, uh, you know, different components, modular components to talk to each other. They all had that. Um, and they all had uh, tools that would help you work within those frameworks. Those are kind of the, the basics. Um, and so when I talk to people, uh, especially people who have been around for a while, they say, well, I remember when we had uh, uh, Orokos, or uh, there's one called Yarp, and that was way better than Ross. Um, and you know, I, don't, I don't get into arguments about technically on those two, two um, uh, based on like uh, plumbing and tools, which one is better. It doesn't matter in my opinion. They're, they're about the same. Maybe they're not. It doesn't matter. Uh, capabilities, that's the first thing that differentiated ROS. When ROS came out, uh, it came out with libraries to support things like planning. Because every robot needs a planning library, why doesn't it just come with whatever robot framework you're using? Uh, perception is another one. You know, 2D and 3D perception are very, very hard. Uh, not everybody in this room is going to be an expert at it, but we should be able, we should have available to us libraries that at least make it somewhat easy for us to implement these things. Um, just execution in general. Uh, there were lots of frameworks, but they didn't make it very easy to actually run a robot. I mean, you look at the, the fetch robot back there. Uh, that robot has to run continuously. It can't shut down. It's, it's not like you can go over there and just kill it from the terminal. It's just got to run. Those kinds of things uh, are, are within ROS, and that's a differentiator. Finally, this is the big one. If, if, you, if, if you didn't agree that capabilities were important, or maybe you just said, well, sure, I could just download those libraries and import them into my, ro my favorite robot framework, uh, you're right. I give you that. You, you could just do that. Um, but the big thing is ROS is an ecosystem. It's a worldwide ecosystem. It's almost impossible for me to go to a university lab that works in robotics and find anybody not using ROS. I'm sure they exist. Some of you guys in the room will probably say, well, we don't use it in my lab. Um, I'm sure that's true. Uh, but it's, it's amazing how many people do use it. And that's, that's the big difference, right? That is why ENM and SIC are interested in ROS because they know if they support it, it's, it's going to have this broad reach and that's good for us because we get good support from the vendors and we can build better, cooler robots and it's good for them because they're going to make some money. And that kind of feeds itself. Um, but this is the big differentiator. No other robotics framework has this, this level of ecosystem. In 10 years, will that change? Maybe. But for now, this, this is the uh, good one. If we look at the community, if we just want to look at some numbers, uh, we can look at uh, every year, or well, now yeah, about every year, OSRF puts out statistics on the usage of ROS, and that's where these numbers come from. Um, if you just look at the number of wiki pages, uh, 
that are described in wiki pages describe ROS packages and give you things like tutorials. Um, you know, this is all user generated content, but you can see the number of uh, wiki pages that are being generated and the growth in that. Um, and then you can also see the number of unique IP addresses um, downloading ROS per month. Uh, and that's, that's pretty incredible growth. Um, you know, I don't know that it's 50,000 people necessarily, because I have at least two or three computers that I've downloaded ROS on. Um, but, but still, that growth is pretty impressive. So uh, three years ago when we were developing, or we were pushing ROS Industrial, nobody really knew who, what ROS was. Um, and so the big sticking point was, well, I don't want to be the first. You know, is so-and-so using ROS? And, uh, you know, it's hard at first because there weren't a lot of people. But now, you know, there are lots of people using ROS. It spans, you know, some of the best universities in the world. Um, it spans startup companies. Um, you know, it's, in fact, it's pretty difficult to find a robotic startup that isn't using ROS in some way. Um, but it also, the, the, there are some very large companies uh, that, that use ROS as well. They're, they're less public about it. Um, but it's, it's pretty impressive when a big company like Caterpillar has a, has a team of people working on ROS. Um, I think that's uh, very, very impressive, especially for companies that move, that, that really don't move until they know it's, it's going to work. Um, and so when, when they throw their support behind something like ROS, that's important. Um, so when we started ROS Industrial, uh, one of the things we realized was that we had to get companies engaged in using ROS. Uh, like I said, when we went out there three years ago, everybody wanted to know who else was using ROS. Um, so we started this consortium because we're like, at the very least, it will force people to put their logos on something associated with ROS. And then we can say, see, Boeing and BMW and Caterpillar and Ford, they all use ROS. They support the ROS Industrial Consortium. Um, so again, there's no question these days about, well, who else is using ROS? Um, because of things like the ROS Industrial Consortium and you know, startups and everything that are, that are very public about the usage of ROS. Okay, I'm gonna show a video of what ROS can do. Um, this is the five-year video of ROS. Um, so this is probably two years old now, because I think ROS is about seven years uh, old. Um, the first thing you should notice is lots and lots of different robots. Uh, you know, I, I show this video sometimes when people are like, well, is ROS really stable or reliable? You know, because it's, it's just some, a bunch of kids on the internet wrote it. Um, the number of hours that is on a ROS system, just by looking at how many platforms actually use it, uh, it's, it's amazing. It, it's, it's reliable by the mere fact that thousands of people have put it on hundreds of robots and, you know, it works. They continue to use it because it works. Um, so that's just, you know, one, one kind of metric that you can use to determine how good ROS is. It, humanoid robots. Mobile platforms, lots of turtle bots. They look different these days. Industrial platforms. So one feather in my hat is Southwest Research was the first to use ROS on an industrial platform. So we, we were at Willow Garage there, so I think they deserve some credit too, because they, they helped me get it working. Yeah, I show some people this video, and they're amazed that one piece, one software can control different robots, mobile manipulators, and and still be useful. The, the, a lot of people are very surprised at kind of the broad application areas of ROS. As software engineers, and probably everything, every most people in this room, 
We just expect that. But you know, go up one level of management and they're made. I haven't done much work with drones, but they look really fun. So these, if you look at the list of these companies, they're some of the best universities in the world and the most forward thinking companies. Uh, it's, it's clearly a community and clearly a force to be reckoned with. All right, what's Ross Industrial? Um, how is it different than Ross is always the question I get. So, you know, I can start with the same thing I started with, with on Ross, which is how um, or why? Why, why did we feel the need to create something called Ross Industrial? Well, in the industrial space, we have limited development tools. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever programmed a FANUC or an ABB robot, um, but it's 1990s technology at best, um, and it really prevents you from doing anything really cool. And that was holding everybody back. Um, so they had limited capabilities, uh, you know, things like vision, that wasn't even included in robot packages, you know, until recently. So, you know, they just, they, they, they were behind the curve. And it was funny that you could go on the internet and download something that had more capabilities than you could buy for 15 or $20,000. Um, no portability or flexibility. So uh, in the industrial space, it's all about keeping you working on one uh, with their products, right? And they develop whole tool suites to make that easy. Um, but the result of that is I can't then transition to a different product. So if I program on an orange robot, I can't then transition to a yellow robot very easily. Uh, in this day and age, it, you just can't do that. It's just not the way um, software should work. And then slow technology adoption. 10 years ago, they were doing things in universities. Uh, it was bleeding edge work. It probably still hadn't made its way into the industrial space uh, because somebody had to see that and then go through the painful process of transitioning that technology. But if we look today at Ross and Ross Industrial, it means the cutting edge algorithm that somebody develops within Ross can immediately be deployed on the industrial platform. So we can we can improve the, the pace of technology adoption. It's always going to be slower in the industrial space. Maybe they'll take, we'll be two or three years behind the curve. Um, but we're definitely going to improve it. So I told you kind of why. Why did we uh, start Ross Industrial? But everybody wants to know what is it? How is it different than Ross? And the primary reason is it's market focused. Uh, we focus on the needs of the industrial space. Uh, this includes all manufacturing, anything that happens kind of under a factory. Um, and the reason you have to do that is you have to sell Ross differently uh, to those, those groups of people, those markets. Um, and they have to feel special. They don't want to download the same Ross that somebody in a university can download. They want Ross Industrial. It's important. Um, and so we felt that it needed to be separate for that, for, for that reason. But there's also some technology focus. So I'll be the first to admit that the core of Ross, we depend on the core of Ross. Um, and that's okay. Um, but we do add capabilities if and when they're needed. So for example, just dealing with industrial hardware, things like the SICK sensors, the SICK LiDAR sensors, um, industrial robots, uh, industrial IO networks, um, PLCs, those kinds of devices exist on factory floors. Nobody in the Ross community at large was really interested in developing those kinds of connections or drivers. So we filled that role. Um, and that allows us to kind of connect Ross to industrial systems. And then we, we talk about extended capabilities, things like we do in industrial spaces all the time. Um, painting, welding, grinding, those aren't those aren't fun and interesting research problems. So again, the broader Ross community probably wasn't going to attack those. But those are really interesting to 
people my, like myself who work under Ross Industrial and um, my, my colleagues that I work with. We're very interested in solving those kinds of problems. So when we develop tools for that, we push them into Ross Industrial. And that's the differentiator. Um, and really, ideally, we would take all of the tools and all the interoperability and we would just push it into Ross. Because technically, there's no reason there can't just be one ROS. Um, it's mostly for market reasons that we talk about ROS versus ROS Industrial. Um, and you'll probably be seeing some other market-focused uh, ROS efforts in the next few years. I'd be surprised if you weren't. So at a glance, uh, if you look at ROS Industrial, I just talked about kind of the things we build upon. Um, this is a good picture of it. The, the three lower layers there are the connections to industrial devices. So we created libraries for connecting to all different kinds of industrial devices. That's the one I'm showing right here is for industrial robots. So you could literally plug into any industrial robot. So that was the first thing we did. Um, and then after that, after we proved that you can actually do that because people didn't think that was possible, um, we then started moving up. And as you move up, you, you move into capabilities. Um, so I talked about these special planners for things like welding and painting. Um, you know, those, those are up there in the, uh, the middle layer there. And then as, as we're getting into actual deployments, we have to create interfaces for these things. Interfaces that people in the factory will understand um, and, and, and seem familiar um, to them. And you know, there's slightly different. There's a slight difference between industrial applications and maybe um, commercial or consumer applications. Um, and so we feel like Ross Industrial is going to go there next. I'll give you a show you a video of Ross Industrial and what it can do. This is our three-year video. So we do a lot of uh, camera calibration, right? So industrial systems that have vision, you always have to calibrate your hand to eye, right? Your camera to robot. Um, so we have libraries that support calibration. Uh, and uh, we can do multiple camera, camera to camera. Uh, we, we do things like uh, Cartesian planning. Here's uh, Ross integrated with a, a Siemens uh, simulator product. Is path planning, robots building blocks. We do a lot of uh, logistics operations too. Uh, a lot of people are using ROS for that. Pick and place is still uh, very important. There was a lot of research in ROS on pick and place, um, and we just got that kind of free uh, in the industrial space. You can see there's lots of different color robots uh, that we work with. Very important. That's the part I worked on. That's why it's very important. Otherwise, it's probably not very important. So here's a routing application. So again, they're very industrial, most of these. Um, I'm not sure they were generally interesting, uh, but you know, to, in the industrial space, there's definitely a need for them. So here's a warehousing application with a mobile platform. Here's the, the Swery mobile manipulator. So, you know, before Ross, the, the thought of integrating a mobile platform, uh, an industrial manipulator, you know, sick LIDARs, uh, all that together, that would have taken a, a tremendous amount of effort. Um, but thanks to Ross and its open source approach, you know, it, it doesn't take much effort at all. This is, these are the ABB uh, Yumi robots. These are uh, human, safe, human safe robots, uh, collaborative robots. They're pretty cool. Um, and the price point for these is, is pretty amazing when it comes to industrial robots. Um, so 
we'll move on. Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit of a pause because that was a lot of information, right? I gave a high-level overview of Ross, um, delve into a little bit of the details, the four things Ross is, you know, plumbing, tools, uh, ecosystem, and capabilities, right? Um, and then I talked about why why Ross was created, and you know why was and and how is Ross industrial different than Ross, and why it was created. But I was going to give you guys a moment. Any questions on on some of that material? Okay, I'm I'm going to limit to two or three. But go ahead. So the question is: Is there a difference in software quality? Um, the stuff that we develop internally, we, we make sure is, has, has coverage via unit testing. Um, we deploy the stuff on um, industrial systems in actual factories. So we have runtime in factories on our stuff. Um, but we do depend on the ROS core itself um, and some of the more core, core tools within ROS. Um, and that stuff is pretty well unit tested. It's got great test coverage. Um, it's also been developed by some of the best developers that, that I've ever worked with. Um, there's this kind of idea that it was just a bunch of people on the internet who, who thought they could program. Um, but really, when it comes down to it, there are better developers in the ROS community than some companies have access to. So um, I think our goal at ROS Industrial is not to create something separate but it's to make people aware of you know the robustness and reliability that is ROS by itself um, and then facilitate making it better certainly um, but we would all live in, a, in a, a good world if there was just one secure reliable robust version of ROS and that's always the goal so not not too much different not not any more secure reliable uh, for ROS industrial So the question was, is Ross Industrial involved in the direction of Ross 2.0? Um, yes, we've, we've certainly been talking with OSRF uh, about the decisions that they've been making, um, but they're doing a pretty good job of vetting the alternatives. I would say one, one important thing that we pushed on early on was to use a, um, I'm going to get down into the weeds, but use a, uh, existing middleware uh, system called DDS that was well known and well respected and uh, had had proven a certain level of reliability to, to get back to, to your point which is you know how do we know it's reliable well it's built on DDS ROS 2.0 will be built on DDS and with that comes a, a certain assurance of reliability um, as far as automatic metrics there there are some um, but they're uh, they're they're not as they're, they're not continuously updated. So things like code coverage would be a good one if you could see how many lines of code you're actually covering in your unit tests. Um, there could be more of that. There's there's not much uh, there's not much analysis. It's done. It's just not analyzed to the point that some people would like. One more or no more. Go ahead. Oh, so the question is, is there some kind of organization that makes sure that, you know, Ross and Ross Industrial, uh, you know, they, that, that there isn't any conflicts between them? Is that the, yeah. Um, so there's OSRF who manages Ross and a few other open source projects. Um, and then Ross Industrial has the Ross Industrial Consortium, which actually exists under Southwest Research Institute but is its own kind of entity. Um, the companies that are in the consortium uh, give technical input and uh, provide technical direction. There isn't any formal process to make sure nothing breaks. Um, 
we we do interact quite a bit, so that doesn't tend to happen. But with this transition to ROS 2.0, for example, uh, OSRF is driving a lot of those decisions. You know, we have our input, but they 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 basically decide what what happens, um, and we're comfortable with that, and we'll just adapt to it on the back end. Um, you know, when it comes to making ROS Industrial work with ROS 2.0, um, you know, it'll take us a year or so, but you know, we'll 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 work closely with OSRF to make sure that transition happens. Okay. I think I'm doing pretty well on time. So, all right. Uh, so hopefully, if if you're a nerd like me, you saw all that technical stuff and you're like, this is awesome. Plumbing, tools, capabilities, ecosystems, tell me no more. I will buy it. It's free, by the way. Um, but not everybody's like me. Uh, a lot of people want to know, okay, what can I do? You know, who cares if there's plumbing? Plumbing doesn't matter. You know, can I make a robot take over the world? Uh, so I like to give some applications. Uh, a lot of these are industrial focused because those are the videos I have access to. Um, but you saw kind of the, the uh, initial video, the initial ROS video. There are lots of applications of ROS. Um, but I'm going to give you some concrete examples, tell you why I thought, hey, this was cool and worthwhile and noteworthy. How many in the room are familiar with the DARPA DRC? Wow. How, did, how many people participated in the DARPA DRC? Okay. All right. I was going to be jealous. I was going to have to come up and, and shake your hand if you did, because we didn't. Um, so the DARPA DRC, the, the main idea behind the DARPA DRC, it was, a, it was a challenge, right? DARPA has been putting on these robotics challenges for the past decade, um, and they've been pretty successful. Uh, but the idea behind the DARPA uh, DRC was the, um, the idea that, so when there was a nuclear disaster in Japan, right, Fukushima, uh, they had these whole systems that were set up to be operated by humans. So they had valves that were meant to be turned by humans, they had switches that had to be turned off, but they're all designed for humans. And, but now it was a wasteland. You couldn't send people in because it, was, it meant certain death. Um, so everybody in this room is like, that's what robots are for, right? Robots are supposed to go in there and do things where people can't do things. I mean, it's, it's an obvious place to use robots. But they couldn't because the technology just wasn't there. Robots aren't good at dealing with human interfaces, whatever they are, light switches, valves, uh, various tools. Robots just don't do that stuff. Uh, it, it's true in the industrial space. It's true in general. So uh, DARPA says, well, let's have a contest. And we'll have a bunch of human level tasks like uh, climbing stairs, uh, picking up a drill and kind of drilling a hole in the wall, turning a valve on and off, um, getting in like a, a small vehicle and actually driving. Uh, you think about like, you see all these autonomous vehicles and the first thing we do is like rip out the steering wheel, rip out all the pedals and we just, you know, plug into the, the can bus and drive these things directly. Um, but you know, the real world isn't like that. And if a robot's going to work in the real world, it has to get in, sit down, and know how to drive. Um, so those are the kind of tasks that they were looking at. Um, and the objective was really just push the state of the art. Can we, can we push our researchers to develop robots that can exist in these, you know, very human worlds? Um, and, you know, we create a contest, and let's see what pops out the other end. Um, and they just, they did that. They finished the contest in, uh, I think it was over the past summer. Um, so it was in California, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. There were, there were two tracks within DARPA. Uh, and this is, this is kind of important because it touches on the two things that roboticists uh, really need. One was simulation. Um, it's really expensive to spin up robotics hardware and it's time consuming to iterate on robotics hardware. Um, you know, as software developers, we're used to, you know, run, oh, did it work? No, okay. Compile, run, all right. You know, it's very easy for us to iterate. Um, 
In order to do that in robotics, you really need a simulator. You need to be able to simulate your environments, be able to bring up arbitrary environments very quickly, bring them down, and iterate. Um, so that was part of the DRC, was simulated. And then they also went into uh, uh, physical hardware. Uh, they contracted with Boston Dynamics, uh, which was bought by Google. Um, but if you know anything about Boston Dynamics, they make the most awesome legged robotics in the world. Uh, it's, they're hands down, they're better than anybody else. So DARPA contracted with them and said, hey, make us a humanoid robot. Um, and that's what they did. And then they gave these humanoid robots to all these teams and said, okay, now make them do all the tasks that I talked about. And um, they, they held these contests. It was very successful. So right, be after, or right before the contest, I talked to OSRF. And I said, you know what would be interesting? You know, DARPA pushed the simulator development. And they, they kind of pushed Ross a little bit, because Ross works with the gazebo simulator that, that they were developing. Um, but how many people actually used it? I mean, we can all agree these were cutting edge applications. These are things robots can't do today. Were they using ROS to solve that problem? Um, and so I asked Brian from OSRF to walk around and just query people who were using it. And he said 18 out of 23 teams were utilizing ROS, and 14 out of 23 teams utilized Gazebo. Um, it's a majority, um, so that's important. Um, it's one of the hardest problems that DARPA could think of, and people use ROS to solve that. So imagine if your problem is just getting a factory robot to pick up something over here and put it over here, right? It's a no-brainer. So I don't know, I, I might skip past a little bit of this since most of the audience is familiar. Um, but the first thing you're seeing in the, the robotics challenge is the simulated environment. This is Gazebo. And Gazebo, by the way, is also uh, um, supported by OSRF, the Open Source Robotics Foundation, and it's easily integrated with ROS. Um, so if you use ROS and you're going to use a simulator, a simulator, you're probably going to use Gazebo. Um, but you can see uh, it's kind of amazing the level of detail. Uh, this is really cool, picking up a hose and, and plugging it in. Um, the cool thing about the simulator is it simulates everything down to the hardware down to the motor control loops if you wanted. So the, cool, the, the, the thing about that is that means I can take my simulator, pull it out, and put in my real hardware, and it should all work the same, because that's how simulators work. So it's, it's getting there. Um, and it certainly helps you debug some of your, uh, your code. I mean, I don't, I don't actually write bugs in my code, but I think some of you guys might, so, um, you know. If you do that, I think this, this is pretty cool to me. Not only were they able to simulate a walking robot, which is kind of difficult, but then you take like a vehicle, and it's Ackerman steering and all that. In the same environment, they were able to simulate it. Here's cool robots doing things. So people always tell me that I'm kind of a pessimist. So I really like the DARPA video where they show the robots falling over. but. That was, they said I couldn't show that one here. So you should all go home and look at that one, because that's kind of funny. Um, and we should cel celebrate our failures as much as our successes, in my mind. OK, so why is this amazing? Why is this so awesome that I felt the need to spend five minutes talking about it? Um, first, they're human-sized robots that walk and manipulate objects. I give a lot of tours to students. Everything from like little kids, uh, I have a four-year-old by the way, so I, I give him quite a few tours, up to high school students, and I show them robots. And they're like, oh, that's not a robot. It, it, it doesn't walk or talk or do anything interesting. Um, and you know, my ego deflates, I, but I get over myself, or at least try to. This, this is a robot by anybody's definition. It walks. I'm not sure it talks, but we'll get it. That's easy enough. Put a speaker on it. Um, it's just cool. Uh, and uh, it's cool that you can do these things in ROS. One other thing that they did that um, I'm not 
sure too many people appreciate. So Gil Pratt was the, uh, the PM at DARPA, um, and he really appreciated this, which is um, they skipped the autonomy problem. Everybody here wants to make a robot that, you know, does dishes, folds laundry, whatever horrible thing you hate doing, you want to make a robot that just does that by itself. It's very hard to do that. Um, so what they did in the DARPA challenge and what Gil Pratt is a big proponent of is skip the autonomy problem. You know, do you get, get a 90% solution and then allow the person to come in for the last 10% because that's what we're good at anyways, problem solving, right? Our robots may get there one day, but you know, they showed with the DRC that a good combination of autonomy and human intervention will solve problems that otherwise couldn't be solved. Um, and I think uh, it came out two weeks ago that Gil is starting a, a research lab, um, Toyota, is that, yep. Um, and this is, this is his big push, is not completely autonomous cars, but cars that help people drive better, right? All right, we're gonna get into an industrial one. So, if you go to any large equipment manufacturer, right, people who build tractors and dump trucks and airplanes, they do a lot of CNC machining, right? So this is, you know, you take a CAD model, you send it over to a, a CNC, it has a big piece of metal on it, in it, it whittles it all away and out pops the finished part. And more or less, it works that way. So you go into these factories at, you know, an airspace customer, for example, and they're Big buildings with big CNCs and not a person to be found. Um, and that's completely automated. That's great. And it, it's, it's generally a, a time consuming and kind of boring job to do, uh, just you know, to CNC these very large parts. Um, so that's all great. And when the part's done, they put it on a cart and they wheel it to a building next door. And that building is full of people. And what they're doing is they're touching up the machining. So they're breaking edges on parts. They're grinding out tool marks. So here we are in this world, this day and age, where you know, cutting metal is completely automated. And taking a grinding wheel to a finished part still is an army of people. Uh, it's a horrible job. Ergonomically, it's really bad. Um, you don't want to. Uh, breathe kind of the, the, the fumes that come off when you're doing these grinding operations. You work under a vent hood all day. It's noisy. Awful, awful job. Um, so, you know, we really want to automate this, right? If you wanted to automate this job, there, the, there's the current way that it's done in industrial robotics, which is, okay, you have a a CNC part, you have a CAD model associated with it, I'm going to pull that into my, uh, we'll call it ten to a hundred thousand dollar offline programming package for robotics and I'm manually just going to pick things and you know in the CAD model tell the robot to uh, you know grind down this edge or make sure this surface is flat. I'm going to do this all offline. Um, by the way that takes an expert programmer, real expensive. Um, the future state as we see it, we see a lot of applications that fall into this, where there's this kind of like human touch-up task, where a human is required because the human can see the part, identify what needs to be fixed, and, and just know how to do it, right? Well, in the future, what we envision is giving robots perception and the intelligence to do the planning to do these kinds of things. So there's no CAD model of a part. You don't have to give a CAD model to a human operator just so they can grind the edges off the machine part. They look at it, they identify the edges, they grind them off. So why can't robots do that? Um, it takes a person out of a pretty bad job and we can, uh, we can do that. The interesting thing is I could go out and buy a $15,000 piece of software from a robot vendor and it's not capable of doing that. But I can download Ross and Ross Industrial and this specific project called Godel, by the way, G-O-D-E-L, and I can have this solution. So I can't buy it, but I can download it for free. I'm going to show a, a video of, uh, of this. 
So we call it, this is just robotic grinding. Um, so grinding away tool marks, but this kind of technology can be applied to painting and deburring and other industrial processes. Uh, this was a, a Ross Industrial Consortium project, and it was sponsored by Boeing and Caterpillar. So the first thing you do is you put, a, put some parts in front of a robot, and it takes a 3D sensor and it scans them. And within that, we analyze the data, and we need a human operator still to tell us what surfaces to touch, but they can do this remotely in a nice air-conditioned office, and they're just telling the robots what to do or what surfaces that they need to process. And then the robot's smart enough to say, okay, I'm going to define, figure out how to uh, grind that surface, and then as a second step, I'm gonna take a, a, a high accuracy laser scanner and do QA in process. So make sure whatever, I, whatever surface that I ground down, that it, is, it meets spec. Um, so this perception and planning part, those are things within ROS. Those are capabilities of ROS, and those aren't readily available in any other uh, software packages. So here you can see it actually working. By the way, you see the visualization, right? This is one of the tools within ROS called Arviz. Uh, it's invaluable for debugging something like this. Um, you know, it, it shows all of your kind of execution logic and your sensor information and geometry all in one spot. So this, this project, as I said, was a Ross Industrial Consortium project. It meant we open source the results. It means things like this are now freely available, right? Again, this is the Ross community working. So why is this particular thing amazing? I, so I showed my wife this, and she's really good at just, just taking me down a notch. She, she doesn't let me think that I'm, I'm too good at anything. Uh, it's probably good because otherwise my head would be really big and it went through doors and stuff. So um, why is this amazing? Well, uh, it's, it's completely CAD free, right? People look at this and they expect, well, robots should just know how to do that. But the reality is they can't. Today's, uh, today's solutions to this problem require CAD. Um, and believe it or not, the CAD system doesn't always talk to the production system in a factory. Um, there's probably, you know, two or three systems in between there that don't even talk to each other. Um, so we can do this without CAD. That means customers can deploy the solution without having to go to their IT department and beg them to, you know, jump or the Ethernet cable between these two things. No offline programming. That's expensive. Offline programmers, very expensive, and it's time consuming. And if the CAD doesn't actually match what is produced, that never happens. Um, it happens all the time. Offline programming just kind of fails. Uh, no configuration management. Again, I don't have to connect my systems. They don't have to talk because the robot can just sense the parts and deal, deal with what's at hand. Uh, three, integrated 3D perception and intelligence uh, with automatic path planning. Uh, believe it or not, industrial robots aren't good at path planning. They're really good at following a, a bunch of taut waypoints they're not really good at figuring out what those waypoints need to be. Um, but Ross is very good at that. There's, uh, and then when you have this automated process and you have high accuracy sensors, right, and they're connected to Ross, you can do this in situ quality assurance, right? I can not only operate on a part, but now I can make sure that it meets spec. And that is something a person can't do. Um, so we've, we're streamlining the process, we're adding automation, we're reducing costs, we're getting people out of a, out of, out of a, a poor environment. This, this is actually an, an easy one to sell to customers. All right, mobile manipulation is another one uh, that, uh, you know, a lot of people when I asked, hey, do you care about mobile platforms? A lot of hands went up. There are fewer hands for manipulation, but here we get them both. Right? We have a mobile system with a manipulator on it. Um, the reason this is interesting from an industrial perspective is traditional industrial robots are bolted to the floor and they, they don't go anywhere. Uh, this means, you know, if that, whatever is within three or four feet of the robot, that's all it can reach, that's all it can deal with. It's not very flexible. Um, you know, it, 
it's, it's very limiting and it means if you have two stations, you have to have two robots. But what if you could have a mobile robot? So your robot can just move to stations. Uh, that, that's uh, very attractive to a lot of uh, uh, people doing production and um, manufacturing. So uh, we set about, and this is, this, is, um, this is actually client funded for Southwest Research. Um, they, they gave us a problem and we said, hey, we, we need to develop a mobile manipulator to solve this problem. Um, and so we set about to create an integrated system with mobility. The application area was actually um, very similar to what Fetch does, which was uh, warehousing. You want a mobile manipulator to actually pick orders, online orders or factory orders, whatever it is. Um, so I'll show you a video. You've already seen a sneak peek of this, but I'll give you some more detail. So the, uh, the mobile base, has, uh, is omnidirectional, has mechanum wheels, so it can actually drive sideways, it can spin, it can do really cool things. Uh, it has uh, two SICK LIDARs on there for safety, and then it also has the, the SICK NAV350 on it for localization. Um, it's, a, it's a cool little sensor that'll tell you exactly where, where your robot is. Um, and then we have a Motoman robot on there. And the idea is that this robot would go around to various shelves and pick orders and then hold 10 or 12 orders on the mobile platform itself. Um, and then when it has to go to shipping, it just, you know, it, it doesn't do one order at a time. It takes a whole set of 10, 15 orders with it. Um, and it makes it very efficient that way. Uh, by the way, that software is also available open source. You can download uh, a simulated version of that robot. Um, and that robot is called uh, Euler, E-U-L-E-R, um, and there's, there's links in the video as well. Um, but if you want to get started with like just a navigation solution, a mobile manipulator solution, you can start with this and at least see the structure. You know, it's Ross, so you can throw out the robot arm and put whatever favorite robot you have on there. And that really just means taking a small part of, you know, your actual application and swapping it in and out. So why is this amazing? Uh, the system was designed, integrated, and programmed in four months. Uh, that's, that's, that's fast. Uh, you guys are pretty fast, so some of you out there are like, yeah, we do that all the time. But um, that is incredibly fast to get a robot that can do full navigation, collision avoidance, localization, uh, have integrated perception, and uh, a mobile manipulator. Uh, or a manipulator uh, integrated on the platform as well. And bring all that to a demo in four months and sell it to a bunch of VPs for the, for the next project. Uh, it, without Ross, that probably would not have been even remotely feasible. Um, so it, you know, that alone, and I think that's why you see a lot of startups embracing Ross, which is in four months, you can go from nothing to something you can put in front of your investors and say, see, it's real. Um, let's see, what else do we have on there? Um, yeah, we had some, so it was really neat, the, the, the SICK uh, lines, laser line scanners for the safety and the NAV350, that stuff was online. We just had to like download it. And the NAV350 was a slightly different sensor, so we actually took some time and adapted the SICK drivers to work with this new sensor. But then we just pushed it back out there, open source again. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of these things where we take a little bit, but we also, give, we also give some back. And we get a lot of support from vendors like SICK and, you know, uh, in this case, Motoman. Uh, we use their robot, we got a lot of support from them. Um, but again, we're building this community. Uh, it's one of the important differentiators for Ross. All right, uh, let's see, how am I doing on time? Got 10 more minutes, it looks like. So uh, we'll, we'll go through this one quickly and then we'll, we'll have some more questions. Um, so this is the combination of all cool technologies today. Uh, we have a mobile robot with a manipulator on it. Very, very cool. And then we combine it with 3D printing. I mean, 
that that kind of project just funds itself. I mean, people just throw money on that. You, uh, you, you can't use it, too many buzzwords to describe that, really. Um, so why are we interested in doing this kind of thing? So we're interested in large-scale 3D printing. Um, you know, it's not enough. You might have a, a 3D printer that can has like a three foot by three foot work area. No, we want to print buildings, right? In order to do that, you need something big and heavy duty. That's the industrial part. And you need something um, that's mobile. It can't just be fixed, right? Um, and so we're, we're in the process of proposing this project, actually. So what you're going to see is some simulated uh, work. Um, but this, this idea is real, and I, I, if we don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. Um, but it's, it's powered and enabled by the technologies within ROS. Unfortunately, I don't have a public video of this one, so you guys are just going to get to watch it. Eventually, we'll make it public. It's just it takes time to work through the system. Um, so all the other videos had YouTube links underneath. So the idea is you would have you know, this large, heavy-duty uh, manipulator and a, uh, um, a, a system that delivers concrete and then kind of shoots it out the front of the robot. And just like with 3D printing, you'd have a CAD model. You'd have to then give that CAD model to some software. We'll call it ROS. And it would figure out how to make the robot build that, build that actual model. So anybody guess what it's building? Southwest Research is in San Antonio, Texas. Anybody know what we love? The Alamo. We love the Alamo. Um, you can see here why an articulated arm is needed, right? You might be like, well, why not just use a big gantry system? Well, with an industrial arm uh, fully articulated, you can do angles and, uh, you know, do more complex shapes. Yeah, we love the Alamo, so we're going to print it. I, this is still very much a concept, um, but the idea would be make it almost work like 3D printing works, right? Uh, you fire and forget. Just click and print. Um, really, you know, that, that's not trivial, right? You got to think about, okay, what's the process? How do you lay down concrete and make sure that it doesn't just collapse under its own weight? Um, you know, how do you make, how do you ensure that the robot can do things all within its reach? How do I move my base so that my robot can get everything? Um, you know, how do I not get the hose all tangled up in you know, the, the robot and the thing I'm trying to make. It's pretty good likeness, I think. Um, and yeah, so we're just proposing that, but that kind of application, we wouldn't even consider proposing without something like ROS. So why is this amazing? Well, it leverages a ton of technologies, right? You have navigation, process-based planning, localization, CAD and CAM, you have process technologies like you know, actually flowing cement and printing cement. Um, but it, if you can do this, then you can print large scale things like buildings and planes. And you can have robots doing this instead of an army of people. Uh, I find it amazing. There are two big purchases everybody makes in their, their life, a house and a car. So the car is 100% automated. It's the most automated thing that is built, really. Um, I'm sure light bulbs are more automated, but you get the picture, right? It's pretty complex, but there are very few human hands that actually touch your car. And your house, which is almost 100% manual. I mean, they, they do very little automation. You know, on site, it's people putting these things together. But imagine if instead of having a bunch of workers building a house, you had a bunch of autonomous robots building your house. Um, maybe a house wouldn't cost so much. Think of the, t the amount of you know, dollar or value you get for your dollar in a car versus a house. All right, there's my contact info if you guys are interested. Um, 
you know, just to recap in, in terms of the applications, you know, a lot of these have a common theme. It's perception and planning. Uh, and, you know, you put those two together and you can do amazing things, but you need the power, you need powerful software like Ross in order to really do those kinds of things. Um, and uh, so we're at 10.25. 10.30 is when the break starts. Um, do we have any questions, Crystal? Um, yes, we've we've seen a lot of that, and we are we are in Texas, and there's a lot of that in Texas. Um, we've uh, we've seen a lot of. Um, but right now, a lot of that is all manual. And it's very dangerous, actually. Um, but they need things like perception and intelligence in their robots to actually support that. So there's the question has to do with uh, 3D printing, like metal, metal powder, um, uh, selective sintering, or something like that. I, we, we haven't done anything. It, so some people are leaving. I want everybody to know that we got to be back by 11. I'm happy to answer questions for the next five minutes or so, but we got to be back by 11. The guys at uh, E&M are very sticklers about this, so, which is good. Um, I can answer for Ross Industrial. Uh, you know, we have, if you go to rossindustrial.org, we have tons of videos that we're working on. Um, you know, for Ross in general, it's, it's generally, you know, because it's so distributed and everybody uses Ross for their own things, you, you kind of, you could go to the Ross wiki, certainly. Um, and it'll give you a hint. You'll see the technology, but you maybe won't see all the, 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 the videos that show the application. So um, a lot of camera drivers. So cameras have been around for a very long time. There's, there's even standards for just talking to cameras. And Ross kind of wraps those standards. So uh, the question was, you know, what kind of vision systems does Ross support? So we, we support a lot, of, uh, camera, a lot of cameras via either the, the, the camera standard interfaces, or there's, you know, name your camera. Um, it, even if it's just a webcam, you just search for that webcam and Ross and you'll probably find a driver that, that somebody has written for it. Um, yes, that's true. So the, the question is whether, the, 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 um, whether we use third-party applications within ROS. We don't use commercial applications like Cognex or Keyence. We do use open source libraries like OpenCV, um, and uh, uh, Erebus is a, a, an open source camera driver that runs a lot of cameras. Um, and then in the 3D world, there's the, the ASUS or the Microsoft Connect-like sensors. Everybody uses those because it's 150 bucks. Anybody can buy them. Um, we're working, so you saw SICK has a, a 3D sensor back there. You know, we're going to work on a driver for that as well. Um, so the, those aren't, you know, there's less support on the 3D side. There's a company called IFM uh, that makes a 3D sensor. There's a, a really good driver for that. But because these 3D sensors aren't, haven't been around for very long, they're custom interfaces for everyone. It just takes longer for those. Um, once you have that driver, though, we use PCL, which is the point cloud library. And that's our open source library for doing, dealing with 3D uh, perception.
Yeah. So the question is, you know, how how reliable or how, how robust are the vision solutions that utilize ROS? Uh, kind of implying versus something like Cognex or TNs, right? That um, and uh, the answer is, if you go buy a commercial vision system, they're going to give you specs, right? They're going to tell you we can identify circles to within, you know, 0.1 millimeters, right? Because they sell you the camera and they sell you the software processing, they sell you the lighting, so they can kind of make those claims. Because Ross doesn't have that, you can use any camera, you don't have to use lighting or you can use the best lighting in the world, um, it, it can't make those claims. Um, by itself. I will say that on the software side, um, you know, it utilizes OpenCV. Um, so from a software perspective, I would say that the tools are, are close to the same. I'm, I'm guessing commercial tools are maybe a little bit more efficient at what they do, um, but it's not a, uh, um, it, it's, it's very hard to say this particular system works better on ROS than it does in a commercial system. All right, and they, they just gave me the time. So, um, yeah, back here at 11 o'clock, please visit everybody in the back. They got some cool toys, or I mean robots or, you know, industrial sensors to look at. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. I've, I learned to condense and on the fly. Uh -oh. Thank you so much. And thanks for the, the introduction. That was a